We're live, Christian Oprea. How are we doing, buddy? Hey, Charlito. All good. All good. We had a really crazy week. And um, I'm looking forward for the weekend. Man, has it been a crazy week. Yeah. It has indeed. <laughs> Big time. But it's Friday, ladies and gentlemen. It Friday, is Friday the Friday. 15th, June 2018. And we are here for another installation of your favorite weekly news. It's Oppie News. Okay. So, this week, for you, ladies and gentlemen, we have some interesting stories coming up. We have a story from Lola, a company that just raised 24 million US dollars, uh, and it's a subscription service that deals in tampons. How in- interesting and exciting is that? Uh, we've got yeah. Google adding tools for brick and mortar stores. So, to Google helping the older, you know, retail high street brands. Um, and making a little bit of a shift in, in some of the stuff they've been doing recently. Chowbotics is a robot that will help make salads for you. And they've just raised $11 million to go beyond salads. Uh, interesting story there. Uh, we've got Uber bringing on a new product director for their driver app. Uh, we've got Carrefour. Car- I never know how you really say it. How, how do the French say it? Carrefour. Car- Carrefour. The Spanish say Carrefour. And uh, um, the Romanians say Carrefour. <laughs> I'm going to go with Carrefour. Car- Carrefour. There we go. More pretentious. <laughs> <laughs> Carrefour partners with Google. This is really interesting because this is a little bit of an insight into where we're going with these whole kind of uh, home voice activated systems such as Alexa and Google Home and all that jazz, Siri. And then lastly, we've got a story here from Instagram, and it's just a little more, another update on where this whole Instagram e-commerce movement is heading. Uh, so that's another interesting one for us to dive into. But let's begin with Lola. Lola, or is it, I mean, it's L-O-L-A. I'm guessing that maybe is like a, uh, what do you call it? Um, it stands for something. Um, anyway, Lola is a, subscription service for tampons and pads and liners and they've branched out into condoms and lubricants and all sorts of stuff now and they've just managed to raise what was they raising 24 24 million million. us dollars right which is not a small amount of money and this is a series b i'm pretty sure uh yeah something like that i'm pretty sure this is this yeah series b funding and i think this is kind of interesting because to raise such a large amount of money uh, isn't very easy outside of the tech world these days, right? If you're not, if you're not selling software or building an app, right, it's kind of difficult to raise 24 million US dollars. Like, that's a lot of money for a series, anything, for a seed round, not for a seed round, for a series fucking D. Um, it's a, it's a big amount of money for any brand to raise, and these guys have managed to get it selling tampons. So, well, this is a, a, a recurrent um, issue for any women uh, woman uh, out there. You know, it's uh, it's a, a problem you face each month, and um, I think this is a really cool idea. I I, I remember you uh, telling uh, me about it uh, six months ago, and I said, "Whoa, this that's an idea I would have wanted to have <laughs> before yeah. these guys." So we actually, Christian and I were discussing business ideas about six months ago, something like that. And I actually said, hey, why don't we start a condom subscription service? And we looked into it and there were some existing companies. And for whatever reason, we decided not to go ahead with it. I think we thought the market was a little bit too saturated already. Um, And the risks of getting sued because the a condom broke. <laughs> right. That, that's another one. <laughs> exactly. Um, yeah, didn't really want to be responsible for bringing new unwanted babies into the world, which sounds horrible. I, I wish I hadn't said that. Anyway, um, 
So, yeah, it's interesting because I think there's a lot of power in subscription services and we saw them take off a few years ago. Uh, suddenly you could get like packs of, you could get like protein kits sent to your house every month. You could get healthy food packs sent, sent to your house every month. You could get Cosmetics. all sorts of different things. Cosmetics, exactly. Um, and it really took off. And I think it, the market kind of quickly became saturated, but we are still seeing a lot of success from those companies that really fulfill a, a need that is a recurring need, that it's something you just can't get away from. We saw it with Dollar Shave Club. You know, yeah. men who, well, any man has to shave, right? Any man has to shave Eventually. on a fairly <laughs> regular basis. Like they have to shave. It depends on how often you shave, obviously. But, um, any man that does shave and doesn't have a massive beard is going to regularly need to restock on their supplies for shaving equipment, right? And so it's just an absolute necessity that people are going to have to have. Um, again, when you look into the supplements market, for a lot of people who take supplements, it is a necessity. It's not like uh, something they feel they choose to do. It's like, no, if I'm working out, I need to take protein or I need to have my cod liver oil or all this kind of stuff. And so... They're going to be re making those repeat purchases a hundred percent. Um, and there are so many other things I can't think of any off the top of my head now that, that uh, su where subscription services have really, really taken off. And, but I've never, I've never seen quite such success in a subscription uh, business. I've never seen such a large amount of money be raised for an e commerce store. I mean, that's what this is essentially. Um, so it just says a lot, and really, what they've what they've done. This is an e-commerce store, right? And and they've focused on on brand positioning, on brand image, uh, with a very very small selection of products. Um, but their business model and the way that they've worked on their publicity and the way that they've built their marketing model has given them insane amounts of success. So I think it just goes a long way and they haven't reinvented the wheel a tampon isn't exactly n a new invention right they're no, taking something that we've been using organic, for years but they made organic. it 100 percent organic i think that's where where they won the um, the fight do you know what i would say i i yeah i think that's a tiny little thing but honestly personally i just think it's it's the whole positioning it's the whole way you present your brand um because anyone can do it, right? Anyone can yep. use some organic cotton or whatever it is um, and and create a tampon. But then how do you sell a tampon? And these guys have done it. They, they haven't gone down the traditional route of trying to sell through retailers. Um, they've just taken control of it themselves. And I think there's there's so much power in that. And I think it goes to show that really if you've got the – you don't necessarily have to have the right um, – you don't have to have a groundbreaking product or, or a game changing product. It's the way you structure your business and the way you, the, 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 uh, the idea you have when you're thinking of product ideas and things like that doesn't necessarily always have to be the product itself, but rather the way that you can sell something, right? The way that you can get in front of consumers and connect with consumers. And that's what these guys have managed to do. It's pretty amazing. And now they've got $24 million in the bank. Indeed. Not a bad idea, if you ask me. <laughs> so, on to our next story. We've got Google adding uh, tools for brick-and-mortar store stores, um, which is kind of interesting because I'm interested to see how they're actually going to make money from this. But essentially what Google is doing is they are adding uh, – what is it they're doing, Christian? They're adding they – um, are. They're adding. allowing companies to add more information about their businesses, um, such as their stock, even if they don't have any online presence or they don't have any an online store. So um, users, when they search for a store, let's say I'm, I'm in my little local town and I want to search for a shop down the road and I want to see what products they've got in the store. And it might be a or a product, not necessarily the store. But right, but let, as well. let's say I know I've got this little store down in town. Yeah. It's called it's called uh, Hudson's Floristry, or let's say no, let's call it a stationery shop for buying pens and pencils and things like that. And I know what it's called, or I search for uh, I search for stationery in my town, right? And it comes up with this store. They don't have an online website because they don't do e-commerce, but this website could now, or th this um, company could potentially sync their inventory with Google in some way so that people can see what they've got in stock 
um, see pictures of all their stock, almost as if it were a, an e-commerce store, I guess, um, and know whether they're going to waste their time going down there and say, look, I need a a special folder. I need to check if they've got that folder in stock before I waste my time going down there and uh, and, and looking and finding out they haven't got it. So it's pretty cool. Um, I think it's going to be interesting to see how we can apply more and more of this kind of technology to help out with with um, offline sales. Indeed. There's an interesting number in this article, and it says that uh, 90% of sales are still performed offline. And I think that's a really big thing for people to remember. Like, e-commerce is incredibly powerful uh, because it has it gives you it gives you so much opportunity to do things. Um, with l- little overheads, uh, with lit- fewer responsibilities, uh, and all sorts of other benefits, but there's still so much money to be made in high street retail. Uh, I think that's Absolutely. a big, big thing to consider. Um, and especially if you can help generate technology or provide or, or assist um, brick and mortar stores in increasing their sales uh, through technology, then I think there, there's a really big uh, opportunity there. For people. Absolutely. Chow Botics. This is a weird one. <laughs> Chow, it I'll is. Leave, I mean, what's, I'll leave this on to you, Christian. That cuts what is your it? salad. <laughs> what the? Right. So Chow Botics <laughs> is a robot that cuts your, that makes salads, right? And they've just raised $11 million. Um, and I don't think they, it's not like a little thing you just have at home. I think this isn't really made for uh, kitchens and restaurants to actually prepare salads and automate services. It's kind of freaky because this is the whole thing that we've all been talking about, how robots are going to take our jobs. And this is kind of weird to see it happening in a kitchen, right? Yeah. But is it like a dispenser or does it actually cut the salads? Well, it says that it's a salad making robot. I'm pretty sure it, it makes the, it mixes all the ingredients together. That's what it does, basically. It selects yeah. different ingredients, knowing like what type of salad has been ordered. It puts all the gre- ingredients into a bowl and then mixes them up, and that's it, basically. I don't think it's the most complicated thing in the world. Um, but they want to move on to making grain bowls now, breakfast bowls, pokey bowls, uh, acai, acai bowls, and yogurt bowls. Basically, anything in a bowl, Chowbotics should be able to do it. Um, which is, yeah, so it's kind of freaky how these robots are actually starting to take our jobs now. But then again, isn't that the same case when it comes to like having a blender in the kitchen, which we've had for years? Surely once upon a time, someone used to have to blend things by hand and thing, and it maybe took someone <laughs> like half an hour to blend up a bunch of shit together because it wasn't that easy. And nowadays, one person just puts all the ingredients into a blender and within 30 seconds, it's done. So surely that robot took our jobs. Uh, and surely this is all just a progression of what we've already been doing for hundreds of years. And it's not really that big of a deal. Yeah, I mean, uh, we, we have bread making machines, but, you know, people still go to the store to buy bread. Now and, uh, well, now and exactly. Then. And people used to have to make bread. There was no other choice. Yep. Um, yeah, it's weird. I don't know. My my brother, who works for a large supermarket in the UK, works for a company called Tesco's. He went to a conference, or he was telling me about a week and a half ago, he was at a special event, and they were talking to them about the basically the future of technology and, and how it's going to affect online sales and all the rest of it. And he was saying how uh, how many of these jobs are going to be, how many of our, just, just how much of an impact um, robots and AI and things are going to have on our jobs and on our ecosystem and how it's going to really, um, how it's going to affect the, the, the way we work. And some he, jobs will be, become obsolete eventually. Yeah. But he was saying that it's like, there's, it's actually quite a dangerous thing looking into it. But this was some guy, I don't know where he's from, but if he's running a conference for the team at Tesco, it's going to, he's going to be a fairly well studied guy. And, uh, yeah, it just seemed quite interesting because I've always been in the opinion that robots will take our jobs, but at the same time, the creation of robots is going to create more jobs. But then my brother said to me, yeah, I had all these questions as well, but then they're going to have robots that create the robots. And then you're going to have artificial <laughs> intelligence that, right? So essentially... It, it's going crazy. <laughs> yeah. So this is will some all jobs go? <laughs> Shit. I don't know. It's kind of weird. It's kind of strange. Um, it has it, been foreseen. 
it doesn't <laughs> worry me. Um, just keep working hard, and that's there it. There we go. So, on to our next story. We've got Uber bringing in a new product director for their driver application. This is the application that drivers have to install in order to uh, use the Uber platform to uh, sell their services. And they've brought on uh, a good old chap called Daniel Danker. Daniel Danker, that's a good name, isn't it? Yeah. Daniel Danker. It sounds like it should be from a film. <laughs> like either like a, like a Bond movie or something. Oh, Daniel Danker. Daniel. <laughs> Uh, like anyway, the villain, <laughs> Daniel Danker. Uh, my name's Danker, Daniel Danker. <laughs> anyway, Facebook has, uh, no, not Facebook, Uber has brought on Daniel Danker, who was previously a product director at Facebook, who was responsible for video and Facebook Live, which we all know have been pretty successful over the past year. Two years? Yep. However long it's been, you know, these things have been really taking off and it's been working very well for Facebook. Daniel Danker, man, has he got a good curriculum vitae. This guy has been working at Microsoft. He's been in the BBC. He was working for Shazam. He's been at Facebook and now he's at Uber. Um, I'm guessing this guy knows his stuff. A pretty busy guy. <laughs> um, so it's interesting to see they're, pro- they're, they're investing in their, the, the driver experience, which I always think is really, really important. It's stuff like, you know, recently, Christian, we've been working on, in, on Amazon, in Amazon Seller Central. And Amazon is such an amazing experience, user experience for the consumer. And then you go into the back end as someone who wants to be a seller and they just don't look after you at all. And there's so, there's so, it's there's crazy. such little information to understand what you're looking at all the time and really, um, have a good experience as a seller. And so I think it's so important for companies to focus on, um, on the hidden side of a marketplace, the, right? The other side that people don't see and drivers are there working their asses off day in, day out, trying to earn some money by, by taking people around cities, annoying people probably as well. Uh, and, and what they need is a nice application that really works for them and helps them make their job as efficient as, as possible. And by looking after those people, uh, I think that will encourage growth. Uh, just by keeping your drivers happy. Um, so yeah, I think it's really important that they're, that they're doing this and, uh, and it's going to be interesting to see what he does with, with, uh, with Uber. I'm kind of interested to see where Uber goes in general at the moment. Like where the fuck is Uber going? Are they going to be bringing in the flying Clark cars? Are they going to be, have they got driverless cars? I'm pretty sure um, Uber's in the, in the race for driverless cars. I think they are. Yeah. Never, I've never researched it. There you go. But I do think, uh, you know, the drivers are the core of Uber's business. So if they don't take care of them, Uber will become obsolete. Yeah, exactly. Uh, especially with other competition out there these days. Yep. So on to Carrefour. Um, Carrefour. Carrefour has partnered up with Google or Google has partnered up with Carrefour. Now, Essentially, what this is probably going to allow people to do is use Google Home uh, as well as other applications. But this is where I see this being kind of cool. They're going to be able to use Google Home to make orders, shopping orders, um, straight from Carrefour. Um, I'm going to say Carrefour. Okay, they're going to be able to make orders from Carrefour. Um, kind of amazing because let's face it, right? This whole smart home. Uh, thing like Alexa, Google Home and Siri and all that stuff. It's been kind of a disappointment, right? Like, have you ever used one of these things, Christian? No, of course not. They're shit. I mean, they're so, they suck so bad. You can't do anything with them. And it's like, it's cool because you've got this little talking thing there and you can ask them questions and stuff. But at the end of the day, you're never going to use it. And yeah, you can ask it to make a shopping list and record your things for you. And you can <sighs> ask it to start a countdown timer for you, for the, food that's in the oven or something like that yeah the the fact is it just it's not it doesn't do enough yet to 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 for you to be able to spend enough time using it in order to make it become part of your daily activities yeah because it it, it does connect with for example alexa connects with you with your lights with your um, with your switches, with, with anything in your home, in your ho- house. So you can make uh, an intelligent or, or a smart home if you'd like. 
But yeah, is that but that's enough? a big commitment, right? That's a big commitment for people to really get all that stuff installed. And I don't think enough people are doing that yet. And until kind of Alexa or whoever else sells that package of installation or the rest of it to turn your house into a smart home, I don't think people are really going to be doing it. Um, Indeed. It's just a small few select the group of people that are actually doing that. So yeah, Alexa by itself doesn't do anything. I mean, right. you, you just talk, talk with it and it gets you answers. Exactly. That, and the problem is because you can't talk with it about many things, there's only ever something you want to actually ask it once every five days or something like that. And so you don't really end up using it properly. I'm sure there are people listening to this who get, who love Alexa and love Google Home and Siri and all the rest of it. I use them every now and then, but I just don't think they're useful enough to become a habit of use, right? But through the partnering with other companies, um, it's going to extend their capabilities. And this is really cool because I think this is going to basically be like the, you remember when Amazon brought out the dash button? Do you know what that is? The dash button. Amazon dash. Not really. Amazon dash is this little um, button that they brought out where you could like, you could order a different button for different brands. And so if you got a, a button, a dash button for fairy, then you could program that dash button to be for a, a product from fairy, let's say washing up liquid. And then you could stick it. It had a sticky thing on the other side of the button. You could stick it under the sink and it's programmed to your account and all the rest of it. It's programmed to your account and to that product. And so when you run out of fairy, you just reach under the sink, push the button and you'll get a confirmation on your phone saying, you've just ordered this item. It'll be with you tomorrow morning. And it turns up at your door the next morning. Right. So right. it really streamlined that um, the purchasing process for those products that you need on a daily basis. And this is essentially going to be something similar, I think. Imagine. So I think one of the one of the things that they always talk about in uh, in Alexa's ads, at least or in the publicity, is that you can make shopping lists on Alexa. I don't think it's the most amazing thing in the world. And by the way, we're talking about Google here. This is Google Home. I'm just talking about Alexa because it's the only one that I've used out of these things apart from Siri. Um, but I can imagine now with Google Home, you're going to be able to make shopping lists um, and say, so tonight, are you looking at a recipe book or something? And you say, you read out the ingredients on the recipe book, Google makes a shopping list. And then you're like, Google, place an order for um, the shopping list I made this morning. And it's going to place the order. And five hours later, your shopping from Carrefour is going to turn up at your front door. Or you can pick it up in the store. Carrefour at go. your door. Carrefour. <laughs> I don't know um, about that dash <coughs> button. I think, to me, at least, uh, I think that's just lazy. <laughs> Why? Because it's lazy. I don't know. What do you the need a, a Do you need a button to order fairy under your seat? Dude, do you need, but do you look, look, right. Why not? If If I can do it, why not? It's the same with toilet roll, right? Yeah. Like, why, if I've got, like, if I see that there's only two toilet rolls left in the bathroom while I'm doing my business, you know, <laughs> instead of, like, going to the supermarket to buy more more toilet roll, instead of writing it down on a list somewhere so I remember to do it, instead of setting a reminder on my phone or opening up a, an, an app or something so I can purchase it through my phone, I'm not going to do any of that stuff. I'm just going to reach next to the toilet and press the button. And I know that tomorrow morning I'm going to have toilet roll there. Why the fuck wouldn't you do that? Because then eventually you'll end up with having 200 buttons everywhere in your home. No, it's only the stuff you need <laughs> regularly. It's only the stuff like you need when you need washing. So wash, I think washing up liquid is a really good one because you only need that like once every one or two months. But whenever you run out, whenever you see it's a little bit low, just press the button that's right next to it. Job done. And you put these in hidden places as well. Toilet roll is definitely another one. Maybe even kitchen roll as well. That's quite important. Um, soap for the bathroom. Washing, like washing detergent, like for your clothes. That's another one. And really, I wouldn't get any more than that. But like, that's enough. That's plenty. And that will, but it can grow. <laughs> yeah, but you don't like, you're not going to use it for clothes and you're not going to use it for like, you're not going to use it for anything else, really. It's literally those those commodities that you need on a... It's basically those things that you need subscription services for. There's an idea for you, ladies and gentlemen. Subscription services for all of those things we just mentioned. Do it. <laughs> and compete with Amazon Dash. 
Anyway, I think it's going to be really interesting to see how these um, home systems, whatever you call them, and home smart home systems or talking systems or AI systems. Yeah, that's systems. how people call them, smart home systems. Um, I think it's going to be really interesting to see how they integrate with other services to extend their capabilities and make them kind of more useful. Because uh, right now, then they're, they're not that useful. Indeed. Finally, we have a story for you from Instagram, and it is just another. Um, it's another step in the, another piece from this um, story of e-commerce, e-commerce's infiltration of social media apps and the apps that we are already using uh, on a daily basis. The apps where we spend most of our time. And Instagram has now added, let me switch over to this one. Instagram has now added uh, a feature where you'll be able to see a shopping bag icon on people's Instagram stories that will display more details about the featured product. Now, I've even seen this with some friends of mine from Spain. I've got some friends who are kind of, um, they're essentially influencers, fairly big influencers in Spain and and I guess uh, these days, if you've got kind of more than 10,000, 20,000 followers on Instagram, they actually reach out to you and, and try and get you to set up a business account with Instagram. Uh, and then I suppose they provide you with all their latest features as well to, so that you can test them out. And so I've seen a lot of friends of mine who are who get contacted by brands to promote their products on their Instagram feeds and things like that. And I've seen one where you can... So on the image, it will have a little shopping bag icon in the bottom left of the image. And this is on the normal feed, not just on stories. And if you click that image, it will bring up information about the product that they have got in the image. And they might just be wearing a jacket or something, and they've got a picture of them wearing the jacket. But then when you click on this little icon, it then shows the actual product image and the product description, and you can click through to buy that product. So they're really, really going hard on this whole e-commerce thing, working on, on Instagram. And another thing I want to highlight is the fact that when Instagram ads first came out, I started testing them straight away. Um, of course, you create Instagram ads through the Facebook advertising platform. And and I had a really bad ROI, like a negative ROI. The cost per click was really high. The cost per conversion was just impossible and it, and it wasn't worth the money. And this week, uh, I've been running a campaign for a client of ours and... I'm really amazed to see that Instagram has been by far the cheapest cost per click out of all these different placements. Um, what Instagram about conversions? Did, it, did they improve the conversion rate? We have an issue with conversion rate tracking in this particular campaign, so I can't, right. I can't, I can't say that. I'm, I'm really interested to, interested to see uh, from your first interaction with um, Instagram ads and the latest if they it really improved the conversion rate yeah yeah well actually the one that was performing best was uh facebook messenger so messenger ads so here get this right on desktop newsfeed and even the right column uh ads have been performing really well uh which right column ads ne were always like kind of touch and go hit and miss you never really knew if they're going to work well but newsfeed and right column on desktop is working really well audience network is costing loads of money and just not working for me right now at all um on mobile anything on facebook isn't working so like facebook newsfeed basically that's it facebook newsfeed and audience network is not working it's really expensive but on mobile instagram and messenger ads are really really working they're really nailing it um so that's what i've kind of learned over the past few weeks at least that yeah if you're going to be tar targeting people on mobile instagram and messenger are the way to connect with them and that really just goes off the back of what we're saying here about these all these releases from instagram people aren't People are wanting to, people are getting more and more comfortable with seeing e-commerce as part of their kind of daily lives in their social interactions. And Messenger and Instagram, I mean, two years ago, e thinking of selling something through Messenger or Instagram was crazy. Uh, and now it's becoming like incredibly popular. You so, have to do it. 
Yeah, exactly. So mobile is um, is definitely taking off uh, in Instagram and Messenger. Mobile purchases on Facebook, it's just saturated. And so advertising on, on Facebook nowadays, I think, is getting really, really expensive for mobile. Um, and so far, a desktop... Facebook's still killing it for desktop um, click-through rates and, and cost per click and things like that. So uh, I just think it's really um, it's really pushing the mobile market. And I think we're I'm really interested to see actually. I'm going to see if I can get it up now before we end the podcast. Um, what the percentage of what the uh, if if there's a survey somewhere, I suppose the percentage of mobile sales um, compared to desktop sales uh, in 2018. Let me see if I can get it up. Um, so we've got from Smart Insights, which I don't know, I've seen these guys around for a long time, so I'm guessing it's kind of um, somewhat reliable. Um, we've got, let's see. I can't find it. Mobile marketing statistics compilation. No. Um, mobile versus desktop usage in 2018. So we had 2016, we had 57% on... Oh, it's going up. So it's more purchases made on mobile than there are on desktop these days. 2017, yeah. it was 63% on mobile and 37% on desktop. And uh, and it's only predicted to go up this year. So we're probably nearing like 70% of sales coming through mobile. And that's not something to ignore. And again, it's crazy. even with web development, this is like everything should be mobile first. Everything has to be mobile first. And, and the cool thing about mobile is that it's opening all these different channels, such as Instagram and all these places where you'd never thought you'd, have, you'd actually sell products. I'm not talking about advertising. I actually sell products straight through Instagram, using it as an e-commerce platform, not a social media platform. It's kind of weird, but that's where we're going, guys, and it works. Um, so get stuck in, join in with the fun, get involved in the action. Don't miss out. Don't miss out. It's now <laughs> or never. Right, let's call it a day there. Let's wrap this ish up. Um, Christian, anything you'd like to say to your fans out there? Have a great weekend, guys. Uh, it's been a crazy week. And I hope you enjoyed this uh, week's podcast. Oh, OP News, actually, not podcast. Exactly. Thank you for tuning in, guys. Have a great weekend. We'll catch you soon. As always, I've been Charlie Center. And I've been Cristiano Brown. Whatever the fuck that was. <laughs>